So let's say we can make one more architectural design to our you know, durable, secure, reliable version control system here that's distributed, right? transparent. Let's see if we can add one more sort of mechanic here to get this higher throughput and make sure that nothing's being starved in our environment. And this would work for both proof of work and our proof of stake or proof of authority, but let's just continue to say we're playing with proof of authority here. So here we are again. Here's our database, uh, DB. Here's our DB. Here's our DB. Right now we're just running a three node, three node peer, peer network. And what's really happening in real time is this, right? CLI tools are hitting this database, hitting this database, hitting this database. Again, we're in Miami, maybe London and Sydney. And anytime there already is a record in here, that's fine. Hey, I need to check this hash, I need to check this hash, I need, and that's good. And having this sort of global database will minimize all the different rights. But it's, again, every once in a while, a new package is going to come into the system. Now, what we're going to do to get some higher throughput is the following. We're going to add another data structure here. We're going to call it the mempool. So each one of these databases will maintain what we're going to call a memory pool. And what will happen is when the CLI tool um, identifies a new package, what it's going to do is just cache that new package, OK? Let's just say it's A, um, into the mempool. So I need to add A at this tag. I need to add C at this tag. I need to add E at this tag. At the same time, J at this tag. And maybe even here, A at this tag. And here, other ones are coming in, B at this tag. OK, E at this tag. There's a whole bunch of people wanting to add new um, packages. And in the beginning, this is going to be very much the same. Now, I said we didn't want to just do one at a time. So what we want to do is batch these at a time. That's going to give us some higher throughput. Now, we're going to have to figure out what is the maximum number to batch? Maybe we do that on network capacity. Maybe we do that on disk like size, all this stuff. But minus all that, we can now do the following. And we're going to get some higher throughput doing this. So let's say we're running proof of authority. Okay, This is one, two, and three. And the algorithm runs, and it's decided that number one is going to write the next record. Now. What we can do now is instead of just sending one, what we could do is create a batch with everything in there, A, C, and E, and send this batch to both the databases. And then those databases identify that it was supposed to come from one. They check audit trails with the previous hash and all that. And then they can write three records, right? Maybe this is now 10. 11 and 12, and they can write the next three records to their database. And then they can see, do I have that same A tag that's pending? And if I do, then remove it. Like, we don't have to do a duplicate. So we can definitely get higher throughput by making allowing each node to not just send one at a time, but a batch at a time. Now. This still doesn't solve the problem where several nodes keep getting selected, and this one is starving. So ideally, we want to add one more thing. We want to also keep the mempool in sync over the peer-to-peer -peer network. In other words, we do the following. This wants to bring a tag in because it's new. Well. What we do is we sync up a tag and put that also in the mempool for all the other nodes. We use the peer-to-peer -peer network not to just do the atomic write, but to keep the mempool sync. Now somebody comes in here and wants to add B tag. Well, we send that over the peer-to-peer -peer network, and we make sure that everybody has that in their mempool. This person says, OK, I want to bring in D tag. No problem. And if it's already in the mempool, because two people are doing it at the same time, it's not a big deal. It's already there, right? It, it's, maybe it's in progress, because this is concurrent, right? 
But we end up all having a mempool that is, looks the same, in, in essence. Could there still be differences? Of course. But overall, you know, on a small network of three periods, they should fairly be in sync. Now the algorithm runs. And the algorithm says, it's three's turn. Well, guess what happens now? Three can create a batch of A, B, and D and send that over the peer-to-peer -peer network. Now, when one gets this batch, it does all its audit checks, the cryptographic audit checks. It does all of that. It writes, again, let's say this is record 11, 12, and 13. It writes 11, 12, 13, and then it looks in the mempool and says, OK, these have been written. Remove it. Same thing happens here. Does the audit trail, does the atomic write, says, oh, yep, yeah, we got these. These are all done. And right before it sent this, it also wrote it to the database. How cool is this? We now have higher throughput because we add a little memory pool cache where what we want to write to the database stays. We sync up our memory pool. That way, we don't care which DB gets selected. What I want to write can be written not just by the node I'm talking to, but any database because those same writes that I want to perform are in their memory pool. This is going to give us higher throughput. We need this little memory pool here. We need to keep that in sync across the peer-to-peer -peer network. And then we don't care who wins. We don't care who's selected. And this is really important in a proof of work where we're burning a lot of electricity. right? At least those transactions are in the mempool of all the nodes. And so this is how we can get a guarantee that we're going to get our stuff written on every single turn. I don't have to wait for this to be selected. I don't have to wait for this to win a proof of work. If we're syncing things up in all the mempools, then we get those rights. And this is how we're going to get that higher throughput. And then the key is, what is that interval? Right? Do we want to run on a, on a quicker interval? Can we run on, like, how quickly can we interval? And then, right, run each one. And then how much? reasonable can we put in a batch? Now, in a blockchain, we don't use the word batch. We call this a block. You'll see me start doing that. But a block is nothing really more than this batch of records we want to write with the complete audit trail inside of it. That way, if we have a bad actor, somehow a bad actor comes in, and they want to send this batch, right? it still has to match the audit trail. And we can validate that somebody's being bad because what they're sending us isn't in the same cryptographic auditable way, right? Their previous hashes are wrong, or they're trying to do things. And we can catch that thanks to the cryptographic audit trail that we're going to create. We'll create a cryptographic audit trail inside the database. And we'll have that at the block level, right? The batch level, too. So we're going to do all of this stuff. This is what we need to build for the Arden blockchain. We're going to need, if we really want this append-only, publicly available, transparent, and cryptographically audible database that runs in a distributed and decentralized environment, this is how we're going to do it. We now have a solution for our version control system. Now, what do we do? Well, I have my database here in Miami. Here it is. My database in Miami. I have my projects. It has that depths dot txt, it lists out those depths. When I run the CLI tool, now right, I can go and fetch everything for the vendor folder. I can bring in those packages and their source code. I can do the hash of everything. And then the CLI tool can compare the hash to this database. And if I wanted to compare the hash of the database in London or to the database in Sydney, it would work because what we've done is created that peer-to-peer -peer network between these. And we're using a consensus algorithm to make sure that the rights are always the same in the same order in a timely manner. And so now any project in our company or on this network can get a guarantee. And if somebody changes some code in a repository, guess what? We're going to know because the hash isn't going to match and we don't have to worry about me going in and trying to change a hash to do that, because it will break the audit trail, and we'll catch it. And we're all guaranteed to have that pure 
the pure ability to have that reproducible and durable build and know if something's changed and somebody from out from underneath us trying to, to hide this. When it comes to version control system, maybe this isn't so bad, but when it comes to money, <laughs> which is what a blockchain manages, this is critical. You don't want somebody going in and saying that, no, you don't have 100,000 units anymore and you only have 10. You've got to be able to catch that and make sure that things like that don't replicate. And, and that's how we're going to be using all this stuff. So hopefully this gives you this, this good sort of background um, on the different things that we're going to need to build for the Arden blockchain, but in a way that you use it every day. Part, you know, parts of the Go module system do this. They leverage some of this blockchain. The Go module databases are you know, cryptographically auditable. They're append only, and you can validate that. Now, the module system is a centralized system, so we don't have to run about the, worry about the decentralized stuff. We don't need proof of work algorithms and things like that because it's centralized. But that idea of append only, publicly available, transparent, cryptographic audibility, all that is there in the module system. That's why I kind of like using this as a starting point. What we need to do is take all of that goodness that you do find in the module system and then add that distributed decentralization to it. That's where the consensus algorithms come in, as you saw. And we're going to build all this. So we're going to build the Arden blockchain. It's just going to be able to manage transactions. We're going to think of it as a, a ledger of accounts with money and the ability for people to send money to other people. And we want to make sure that that's distributed. Okay? And we want to make sure that's decentralized and that everybody can participate in this and everybody can validate that what the database says is what it says today and tomorrow. So everybody's money is safe. We're going to use these same ideas. And that's what we're going to do next. We're going to start building out our Arden blockchain, a semantically correct reference implementation. And after that, we're really going to have a good understanding of how Bitcoin works and Ethereum works and, and the ideas behind it and the tech behind it. Um, we're not going to have, I think, production level implementations of everything. But they're going to be semantically correct. And it's all going to come back to this, so I may be coming back and say, remember in our version control management system when we did this? Yeah, there it is. So hopefully you've got a good handle of this. If, if you still feel like you don't, watch this again. Just go through it again. And I have a blog post on the Arden Labs website about the practical uses of blockchain technology. It kind of walks you through these ideas as well. So maybe reading that will help. But the more of this you can have somewhat of a foundation for, um, it's going to be a little bit easier as we move forward in the code.